Uh, hi, I'm John Bridges. I'm a lecturer here at the University of Texas after a long career at the Austin American Statesman. Um, now we're going to transport ourselves to some of the most contentious places in Texas. Those are our classrooms and our school board meetings. Um, with us today are some panelists who so far have survived the front lines of those battles, and they will share some of their stories of uh, transparency and accountability in Texas schools. Uh, we have with us on the far end, Carrie Heath, who covers K through 12 education for the Austin American Statesman, and previously was at the Galveston County Daily News. We have Dave Hendricks of KVEO CBS4 in the Rio Grande Valley, whose coverage of IDEA charter schools has resulted in numerous uh, open records rulings and uh, lawsuits, and Dave has a lot going on in this, in this uh, realm. And then Kate McGee, higher education reporter for the Texas Tribune, whose reporting on Texas A&M led to um, an entire leadership shakeup at the university this summer. Um, so thank you, panelists, for being here. Uh, join me in welcome, welcoming them, if you would, please. Thank you. So we'll start with just a broad question, um, if each, each of you could weigh in on what are the biggest challenges uh, regarding transparency that you're facing in your area of coverage now? And Kate, why don't you get us started? Sure. Um, I think, especially when it comes to records, um, and some of this was kind of brought up in the previous panel, was um, universities that really hide behind the process um, weaponizing um, the the law in their favor to slow down requests. You know, they have 10 days to respond. Um, I can almost guarantee I will get an email back on the 10th day at 4.45 p.m. Um, to ask for a clarification that then kicks it off another 10 days. Um, and that's a continuous cycle. Um, and then when pushing back on, you know, the promptness of the law, not really getting a response um, or really change, having any kind of accountability to change or, or speed up their process. Um, and then also no one really wanting to talk, uh, either media relations requests generally. Um, you know, I have some universities are better than others, but some just do not respond at all. Um, like UT Austin has not responded to a media request of mine in two years at this point. Um, other schools will just give statements or reply no comment. It's been very hard to just get people to even answer interviews. Um, and I would also say, like, when you do get open records requests back for emails or documents, there is um, not a lot of, like, uh, accountability or transparency to even explain, like, what some of these documents mean. So you're kind of forced to rely on documents that might not tell the whole story because you're not having like an open conversation with the universities themselves um, about what exactly you know some of these emails might mean. So those are kind of my constant you know back and forth issues I'm having. Cool. Maybe the UT people can hear us since we're <laughs> we're here. We'll talk loudly. Um, okay, Dave, uh, biggest challenges. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so I work at a TV station in the Valley, uh, and. In our area, we don't have one large school district, right? We have 24 different traditional school districts plus charter schools. So the very basics of the act, who to contact, what is the designated email address for that person, can be very difficult to manage. Uh, and when you have districts or other governmental bodies that won't share that information, just getting your request in and getting it processed by someone who understands what the law is can be very difficult. Um, and I think the, the point made before was very well taken about the weaponization of the process. You often have school districts uh, that will, instead of redacting records uh, with very common exceptions, uh, will just send everything to the Attorney General's office and have them redact it for them. Uh, and so that takes a request that could have been fulfilled in maybe 10 days and stretches it out to three months. Um, so it becomes very difficult to get that information out in a timely manner. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think um, just sort of jumping off of that, one of the challenges that I've found with reporting on schools is that because you're dealing with student information and some of that is, um, you know, by law, such as names, allowed to be redacted, that will, that's something that agencies will often use to delay requests or try to not give you exactly what you want because they say that redacting it would just take too much time or be too, too costly. So I think that 
because we're dealing in education with a lot of information that is sensitive, the student information, that's something that agencies can often use to not give you what you're asking for and what you should get. Cool, thank you. Um, Kay, could you walk us through your reporting into Texas A&M? You had two <coughs> major stories um, uh, this spring and summer. Um, and how the open uh, records laws sort of factored into your reporting and how you made use of them. Sure. Um, so the first story we published was about um, the journalism professor, Kathleen McElroy, who had been hired to run A&M's journalism program. Um, and through after she had been hired, the university kind of started to walk back their job offer to her <clears throat> until going from a tenured position to a one-year contract that was untenured. Um, until she ultimately declined the request and is still here at UT. Um, that one, we were approached by Kathleen, and so we, she was able to provide documents, and um, the attention that that, that it was interesting because the attention that whole story got nationally, you know, led A&M to do something very unusual, which was to do their own investigation and then just present, release dozens, hundreds of pages of emails and text messages um, that showed behind the scenes what was going on and what, you know, what had really transpired between the Board of Regents, between the former president who ultimately resigned. Um, we knew they were going to do an investigation, but um, I think it was surprising how much they um, really openly presented to the public, um, partially I think because so many outlets had put in open records request once our story published, ourselves included. Um, and so the, that was, um, I don't know, just like a, a very rare instance though. I have never really seen a university in my experience here do that and be so forthcoming with the documents. Um, the second story we published about a pharmacy professor at A&M who had been put on leave for allegedly criticizing um, Dan Patrick, the lieutenant governor, during a lecture. That was a very different scenario. We had gotten um, a tip about that in April and had put in our first open records request in early May. And it took about two months to get the first round of documents from A&M. Um, they kept delaying the, the request. Like every Friday, I would get an email saying, we're still collecting these records. We'll get them to you next Friday. I think we got them <clears throat> by mid-June, um, and that was kind of the first batch. In that time, I had submitted other open records requests, um, and this was just for her emails, where I basically said, I'm requesting all her emails between a certain date with the certain uh, keywords that we wanted in the emails. Um, and so we ultimately were able to get um, some information from those emails, but not um, enough to be able to tell the full story we simultaneously put an open records request into the University of Texas um, Medical Branch in Galveston because that is where she had done the lecture. They charged us uh, money and took months to get us documents as well and then also went to the AG on certain documents which I actually got back this week because the AG um, said that they had to release some of those documents. Um, and so it was a back and forth um, and it was a a learning process for me and my colleague, James Barragon, who worked on this story with me, because we just started targeting A&M and UTMB, and looking back, I would have put an open records request to Dan Bat Patrick, to the land commissioner, Don Buckingham, whose daughter was the one who originally, this complaint originated with. She was in the classroom. I would have done that immediately, because it was actually Dan Patrick's office who provided the text messages between him and Chancellor John Sharp that really enabled us to go back to A&M and kind of force them to explain what was going on. Um, so that was, you know, it ended up, that story came out a week or two after the McElroy story, but we had been working on that for a few months um, on and off, you know, as other things were going on. There was the legislative session and impeachment, so it was kind of an on and off project. But ultimately, we would not have told that story, been able to tell that story without getting records from the school and the lieutenant governor to kind of piece together what had happened. So to clarify, some of that, only a small part of that was an actual request to the AG's office to withhold documents. Most of it was just delaying tactics. Right. Um, we, so a and for those who maybe have never um, put in a request to a university, they have a portal 
where you can say, do you agree to certain redactions? And I had done that for expediency because if you basically, if you say, no, I don't agree to redactions, they almost always just kick it to the AG's office. So I said, I was like, let me just see what they have. I got the documents. I did not, I, I knew through other reporting that there was other documentation out there that they had not included. So I kicked it back and said, no, I don't agree to the redactions, have the AG's office deal with this because I did feel like they were withholding things that they should not have been, um, they, that they should have released. So as that process was going on, I was filing other open records requests around the same topic to A&M and those requests came back and provided more information. Um, so it was kind of a multiple back and forth process. On the UTMB side, they were the ones, and the UT system were the ones who went to the AG immediately and said, we don't want to, you know, we don't think we should have to give these documents up. And obviously that was a months long process because we just got those documents back this week. Thank you. Uh, Dave, walk us through your coverage of um, IDEA charter schools and um, sort of what you were looking into and, and all of the um, open records requests that have resulted from that. Sure. Uh, so in 2020, uh, right before the pandemic started, um, there was a leadership change at IDEA Public Schools, which is one of the largest uh, charter school systems in the country. It's based in the Valley. Uh, and so when their uh, founder and CEO left, uh, I started putting in requests to find out how much money they gave him to leave, what the circumstances of his departure were, all of the basic things that you would want to know in a situation like that. And then the pandemic happened, and I got a real lesson on, uh, from their attorneys about how to use the act to delay and then not release records at all. Uh, so I got a tip uh, at one point that uh, the executives beyond the CEO who left uh, had been spending money uh, just kind of on whatever. Uh, lots of things that you would never expect to see a school district uh, spend money on. So I put in requests for the uh, expense reports submitted by these executives. Uh, an idea used the pandemic to not respond to the request for a year. Uh, because during that time period, you could just put it off, right? And the AG's office had, had allowed that to happen. Uh, but it didn't mean that the school district was shut down. It didn't mean that people weren't in the office. And it didn't mean that people didn't have those records. So after I requested the expense reports, IDEA pulled them and said, oh, and the CFO left, the COO left, the superintendent left. Uh, and they conducted a full investigation with an outside law firm and two f sets of forensic accountants uh, before they processed my request. Uh, and when it did get processed uh, in 2021, the AG's office said, well, this is a very basic issue, right? This is public money on an expense report. Uh, you must release it. And IDEA said, no, I don't think so. We're gonna sue the Attorney General's office. Uh, and so to this day, uh, those documents have not been released because the Attorney General's office, as I found out, does not litigate those cases. So if a governmental body sues uh, to block the release of those records, the AG's office will file like a very basic denial like you'd see in most lawsuits and then never follows up. So those records just end up in limbo. So that happens with the expense reports. It happened with uh, information about the school system buying a uh, boutique hotel uh, near South Padre Island. Uh, and it also happened, uh, interestingly, with uh, their committee meetings. So like a lot of uh, governmental bodies, they have committees, right? And the committee consists of less than a quorum of the board. And so they post their committee meeting agendas online. They say that they're open to the public. They include language that suggests they're subject to the Open Meetings Act about executive session and, and what have you. Uh, but when I requested videos of these meetings, they said, well, no one actually attended this meeting. And so then you get this tree falls in the forest thing where if you have a public meeting and no one showed up, can you withhold what happened during that meeting if less than a quorum of the board is there? And the AG's office kind of sidestepped the issue. They said, well, if they didn't go into executive session, then you must release these videos. And again, IDEA said, no, we don't agree with you. We're going to sue. And so we haven't seen the videos either. Um, so I think it, 
it revealed a lot of problems with the way the law is set up um, from the way that the business days were just kind of waived during the pandemic to the fact that the AG's office does not litigate um, against a governmental body in most circumstances when they sue uh, and just kind of showed that if, if you have a good lawyer, you don't have to release anything if, if you don't want to. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, you've been reporting on the Texas uh, Education Agency, um, their involvement with the Austin School District. Uh, an agreement was just reached where um, the Austin School District will have a conservator or a monitor looking, uh, important distinction, uh, monitor overseeing their special education administrative duties. Um, yeah, tell us how how do you see the TEA's role in local districts? We saw it in Houston. How has that affected accountability? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, there's been a lot of um, discussion over the last few months, especially with the legislative session earlier this year, about the role that TEA and the state really plays in, in local education. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the, that discussion has really put a lot of um, districts at odds with, with the state. Um, you know, in terms of reporting on the special education issue with, with Austin ISD mm -hmm. specifically, I mean, one of, one of the challenges I've ran into with, with records is, is if, you know, the district says it hasn't necessarily kept some of these records uh, in the past. And so one of the challenges I've found is actually getting hard data on what they say they did in the past or what these numbers were um, previously is, is difficult if the district says they just don't have these records. Um, and, you know, I think one of the challenges with getting these things from TEA as well is that they, they keep, require very specific data, but sometimes what you're looking for isn't, isn't readily available or isn't tracked. Um, and, and so I think with reporting on special education issues, that's one of the that's one of the challenges as well. It's just what, what data they keep, what data they report on, and what, um, what they say they have available. Cool. Uh, um, in relation to these monitors, uh, Dave, you were telling me that you've had some experience or some frustration trying to find out what the monitors are up to or, or the results. Um, why don't you fill us in on that? Sure. Uh, so my experience with that comes through uh, La Jolla uh, Independent School District in the Valley. Uh, TEA is in the process of trying to put in place a board of managers there. Uh, and so there, the TEA does a regular review of monitors and conservators in the state um, where they're at in the process because they eventually transition out right as the district accomplishes what the TEA wants them to do. Uh, but getting copies of those reports which kind of give you a, a high level view of where is this district in the process of moving out of a monitor situation or a conservatorship uh, TEA will sometimes assert a, uh, an exception for uh, an audit working paper because uh, they consider it part of an audit. Um, and I don't, if you've ever dealt with an exception like that, once they assert it, you're pretty much done. And so it can be very difficult to see kind of where in the process a district is of, of moving out of state oversight. Interesting. Um, uh, Dave and Carrie, do you, and Kate as well, because uh, I'm sure you'll be covering this. Um, we're about to have a special legislative session on uh, school choice or vouchers. We can't even decide what to call the things. Um, as Texas relies more heavily on privately run schools, where do you see, um, how do you see that impacting um, accountability and transparency? I, I think that's been one of the debates in, in the school choice voucher uh, conversation. I, I think how much, if, if this policy were to go forward, how much these private schools would be beholden to public information laws, how much they would be beholden to the accountability laws that the public schools already have to follow and, and the testing that the public schools have to do. All of that is, um, for the most part, publicly available information that that's public schools have to report. And so I think part of the debate is how much these private schools if a school choice program were to go forward, would have to comply with those laws. And, and there's a lot of, you know, as, as much as school choice is a kind of um, spectrum of, 
uh, of, of issues and people have sit differently on that spectrum about the, it's, people also sit differently about whether they think these private schools should be, have to comply with those, those laws. It's, it's um, there's not a clear side one or the other. It's very tricky. No, I think that that's exactly the issue is to what extent, right, schools that accept public money should be subject to the Public Information Act. Uh, and also, you know, the, the big attraction, right, and the big concern for people who oppose the charter schools or, or public funding for private schools when students attend uh, is the is the issue of they're not they don't behave as as a traditional public school would, which is, is could be good or bad, but they are public, especially in the case of a charter school. And so the the board members and the administrators sometimes don't have the same sense of their obligation to the public about what information they must release, how they should react when someone asks for information, what they, meetings they have, do they have to be open to the public? And so as that kind of process goes forward, I think it's, it'll be important for the legislature to think about what kinds of training they require for uh, boards so that they understand those responsibilities. Um, we've seen uh, involvement of parents around particular issues around uh, uh, teaching of race and, and uh, gender identity and these kind of issues. Um, and I've seen national reports of parents filing more open records requests. Um, I'm curious what your experience has been with sort of that uh, movement. Has it um, made things easier for you, harder for you? Um. Yeah, I, I think school boards have really become um, a, a hotbed of, of debate and across the country, but you certainly here in, in Texas as well. Um, and I think, you know, we can debate why that is, what role the pandemic had in, in making people more interested in their local school districts. But, um, you know, I think that means that districts are really having to um, answer a lot more questions for, for better or worse. Um, and um, that does mean that a lot of parents are filing more public information requests. And I think that that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, I, I think that means that the, the public is more engaged. You know, traditionally school boards are a place where people don't pay a lot of attention. I mean, I was at this very important vote on Tuesday night about the future of special education at Austin ISD. And it was me and a few other reporters and maybe three members of the public at one of the biggest districts in, in the state. Um, and so, you know, while I, I think there's a, a real challenge in um, the the debate about what's taught, and, and there's it, it's not necessarily a bad thing that people are becoming more um, interested in, in local government. Cool. Um, what is it? So we have a number of uh, students and younger reporters here. What, what advice uh, covering schools would you have for them when it comes to um, digging in to accountability issues? Uh, any of you? Okay, you can start with it. Um, <clears throat> I would say, you know, file often. Um, and just file frequently and um, do not be afraid to file requests. You know, I think that um, even emails and documentation and memos that um, your government, your, your university is producing, um, people get annoyed or, you know, when their emails are open, are, you know, subject to open record, but that is the law and you are um, totally uh, within your right to know and see those emails. Um, and so I think, like, do not stop asking for that information. Um, I, you know, I would use this foundation as a, a resource as you're trying to figure out how to word document, like, word your requests and make sure that they are, um, you know, being worded appropriate or correctly so that a university can't really sidestep um, or avoid giving you what you want. Um, I have that happen often and have had to just become better at figuring out ways to make sure that I'm asking for exactly what I want. Um, and, you know, reach out to, 
you know, journalists who are working in the field, we are happy to help um, if you have questions with how to word a, a request um, and you want advice, you know, don't hesitate to ask for that because that's, we're happy to, to kind of help and guide you along the way. And I think jumping off of that, I've had to do a lot of self-education on all the terminology and the technicalities that are in the education world. It's, it's very specific. There's lots of acronyms. There's lots of very specific terms for, for, um, for what you're asking for. And, it, and it's important when, when you're filing a request. Um, and I often just talk to an expert, not someone in the organization I'm trying to get information from, but um, someone who can walk me through what all these terms are so I make sure I'm asking for the exact correct thing that I want. I guess I would just try to not be intimidated by the, the process. I know when you're trying to file a request, you might say, oh gosh, what should I ask for, right? Uh, but just remember that the, the school board trustees or the people on the city council or you know the university's trustees, they are not experts on government or education often. And so they, they get packets before their meetings, they get memos from the superintendent or the city manager that help them make decisions and educate them about the issues that their organization is facing. And so often the best place to start is there. You know, you can read the same packet, you can read the same memos um, by filing a, a public information request and you can educate yourself just like the, the people who are governing that organization are educating themselves. And that often is a, is a really good place to start. I would also add that, um, you know, don't just rely on submitting the open record request to you know, the school or wherever you're um, submitting it to, um, call the open records, you know, the person in charge of their open records division. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes they are open to like helping you as well to make sure that you're requesting what you want or what you need and so they can help you frame, you know, frame your request. And sometimes just having that conversation can help the process and kind of putting a voice to your email can kind of help that move faster. Um, so don't be afraid to call them and say, you know, hey, I just submitted this request. Can you take a look? Does this seem like something that, you know, it, does this make sense? Is because, you know, they will kick it back to you and you, you know, you want to try and make this process go as quickly as possible within the confines of, of just how long the, the process can take for open records. Um, I've, I have not, I've had some success with that. Sometimes, you know, even in this, a, this instance with a, reporting on um, A&M over the summer, UTMB told me they would not talk on the phone because they, the law says that they have to put everything in writing, um, which I don't think is correct. And I told them so, but um, it was, it's just worth also to kind of know what you're dealing with when you reach out to them um, and see how they respond to your requests and how helpful they might be because sometimes they can be very helpful um, and want to help you, know, you get what you need. Uh, and since we have uh, numerous First Amendment uh, lawyers and people who uh, lobby the legislature, is there something you would like to see changed in the Open uh, oh boy. Information Act or, <laughs> or the Open Meetings Act? Um, um, I think I would love to see more like an avenue to kind of find a way to put um, pressure on, on prompt responses. I know that these universities are getting lots of requests and they're dealing with, um, you know, multiple requests on a daily basis. Um, but it does feel like the routine of always getting a response on the 10th day, it, it, that is becoming the norm and it's beyond just the, the load of requests that they're dealing with. Um, and it does kind of seem like you're stuck in, in the waiting game with them. So something to do to kind of put more pressure on them to respond more promptly. I think that uh, it's become very common, and I'm sure many people have noticed it for a school district, a city, when they conduct an investigation to hire a law firm and do things through the firm. Um, because normally an audit, a completed report, or an investigation is public. Uh, but by doing that through a law firm, they cloak it in the attorney-client privilege, uh, and they can withhold it. And you've had all kinds of very, very important internal investigations all across the state that no one is ever going get, to get to see because it's been done through a law firm. And so I think that the state needs to take a very serious look at that because these boards make 
extremely consequential decisions based on these reports uh, and the public has a right to know what happened and why these boards are making those decisions and instead all they get is as discussed in executive session. Yeah, I think jumping off what Kate said, it does sometimes feel like the delays that districts are able to, um, you know, we, we're processing this request but we don't have enough people to in our information office or we're processing this request but we didn't know exactly what you meant or we we're processing this request but um, you know we we can't find exactly this data that that you you wanted and so we need another 10 days I think um, clarifying for both parties you know would be helpful in which instances um, uh, the the requested agency is able to actually delay if they're able to delay I, I think that'd be helpful for both ends cool thank you um, I'd like to open it up for questions uh, yes please Go, uh, let me let me repeat the question yeah. real quick so our question was um, uh, what has Kate learned uh, about requesting emails uh, because it's a volume can be a voluminous uh, request um, yeah what, what have you learned um, I a few things. Um, I started out, uh, I try not to overload it with too many people um, who I'm requesting emails between. Um, I will often, you know, if I get a tip, like for instance with this case with the professor, um, I started out with her emails, but then I also typically go to the website um, and like look at an organizational chart and say like, okay, who are the people above her who she would be communicating with? and I will request their emails to and from. But I try not, not to overload it because I don't want to get a kickback to me and said that it's, you know, it's too overburdensome and, I, and they want me to narrow the request. Um, in that instance, the, I do find in an instance like this where we were talking about a censure and um, the words were a little hard and I found that was less effective than my second request which was just shortening the time period to like March 7th to March 12th and I asked for all of her emails um, and that uh, that I found was more helpful in, um, in this particular case you know I've done other requests a couple of years ago I did a lot of reporting on the eyes of Texas song here at, at UT that was a case where the keyword eyes, eyes of Texas got every, everything because that was such a commonly used word. So I do think it's kind of a case by case basis. Um, but I, I think that with this Alonzo case, I had to put in multiple requests. Um, and it, it, I did find, and I do find now as I, because I'm still putting in requests for, at the University of Texas side because that part of the story was really, is still a little unclear as to what happened. And I have put in requests for individuals' emails, and I've really shortened it to just be like one person's email and using keywords. Now that I've been doing this reporting for months, I've been able to kind of narrow down those keywords. Um, but I try and keep it within like five to seven people if I'm using a lar if I'm you know trying to cast a wider net, um, and I keep it as short a time frame as I possibly can, um, knowing that you know. Let's say you know if I have a week's worth of emails and I see that the conversation is going, I might have to file another request. But I kind of feel like it's better to have the piece, like kind of get some of the, do some of the reporting and see what's happening, and then file one rather than going back and forth on this is too overburdensome. That's a good is question. It, yeah. Uh, so there, our question was, uh, is there a way to? avoid duplicate email so that you end up with just the same string over and over again, which we've all dealt with. I have not found a way to do that. Um, I have had, a, I actually at A&M in one of the requests, they did ask um, if I, if, if I wanted to, you know, get some of the, if I could eliminate or if they, if I was okay eliminating like chain emails or, or kind of marketing mm -hmm. emails. And that did help when I said that because then I wasn't getting, you know, a lot of universities will send out like this is what was in the media that day about A&M or whatever. And th they were willing to kind of help me kind of weed through some of that. So having a conversation like that can be helpful and just kind of limiting what kind of emails you want. Um, but in other instances, no, I have not found a way. Maybe you guys have suggestions on that. 
So a uh, question is about the process, the investigative process regarding the idea school story and um, I assume th their lack of investigations at the, at the time. So the information does get sent to the attorney general's office, but they don't typically conduct uh, like a criminal investigation, um, or at least not that I'm aware of from information that's submitted through the request for decision process. Um, so in this case, the investigation and idea was conducted internally, uh, and then they referred parts of it out to the U.S. Attorney's Office or the Rangers uh, as part of DPS. But as far as I'm aware, no, no prosecutions ever resulted from it. Okay, our question involved school district police uh, departments and um, sort of the cloak of information that surrounds them. Um, Carrie, do you have deal dealings with, uh, with that? that that's, a, that's a great question. Um, something I'm trying to work through myself right now. Um, and I, you know, I think that what, what I have found is helpful is trying to request very, very specific pieces of information, kind of trying to go in knowing what I'm looking for. Um, I think there's, there's also ways to get this un information through other agencies, through the local police department, through the Texas Education Agency. It does depend on what exactly you're looking for. Um, that, that's definitely a very tricky area, um, especially when you're dealing with student-specific information, but I think trying to work around the district itself um, and also going in with very specific understanding of what you're trying to get is, is the best way I have found to, to get that information. So our question is, um, uh, the way the police departments work with open government laws, are, are, they, are the school district police departments, uh, do they have to follow the same laws as everybody else? In, in some ways, it, it depends on how the, the district police department is licensed. If, it, if it's a legit, actual police department, then yes, many of the same laws are similar, at least. Um, but, but sometimes districts don't have a fully developed police department. So it, it, I think it depends on the specifics of the district's security and, and police. Anybody else have experience I have with that? No, I would just add that, uh, so like we were talking about, if a school district's police department is licensed through the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, um, then they follow all the same state laws. But another avenue you can use is many districts have officers from a local police department provide their uh, police services. And so that can be a, another avenue. Um, but it is very frustrating, right? Like a basic or front page of a police report that you could get for a crime that involved an adult, you cannot get for a minor. And so that's everybody pretty much at a, at a school district. Yes, our question is around public shaming. Um, <laughs> so uh, when you report on uh, delaying tactics by an entity, um, have you seen success with uh, reporting what they're up to? Yes and no. Um, I definitely think it's worthwhile and is, um, could be a tactic to use, especially if they're delaying. Um, in the most recent incidents, we didn't because a, it's like you have to weigh, do you want to um, scoop yourself in a way and report on the process that, you, you know, that is frustrating, but then you kind of lose the surprise of the big swing of your story. Um, and I think we wanted to wait and kind of see what we could, um, what we could nail down because we knew the story with the uh, case of Joy Alonzo. We, we, knew, we knew what was happening and we just couldn't f find ways to nail it down for months. Um, and we had people talking off the record or getting scared because they didn't want to get in trouble. And we had students who didn't want to you know, use their names because they were afraid of retaliation from the school. And so we were, I think if we had done a story about you know, A&M delaying the records yet again, it wouldn't have been as successful. But I do think it can be helpful. And it, I, you know, I, I was thinking back to some of my reporting on the eyes of Texas. They gave us a ton of emails that we had requested. Um, 
but because I had in the meantime requested, and I will, I did this in both cases with A&M and, and UT when it's taking a long time, I will put in a request for any documents that have already been collected and released along the same subject lines to see if someone else has submit, like submitted a request and gotten some documents. Maybe I can get something in the meantime that I can kind of see what's going on as I'm waiting for my request. Um, and with the Eyes of Texas, I got some emails back that showed me that UT had not given me all the emails that they should have because I was finding new emails in this other batch. And that forced them to go back and they realized they had made some kind of documentation error and we got a whole other batch of emails that ended up being a follow-up story that in that story we did explain the process of why we were reporting this again because UT had not given us all the emails in the first go around. Uh, in that case, I feel like it was appropriate to kind of explain why we were kind of dragging this back up. Um, so I think it, is a, it can be useful, um, but it kind of depends on the situation. I also think it can be helpful when you get the request back to kind of explain more or less to the public, um, you know, if there's a lot of redactions in the request or if there's certain information that you wanted but weren't able to get or if there's something that you're still, you know, waiting for that's been kicked up to the Attorney General's office. I think sometimes it, it, it is a case-by-case -case basis, but sometimes explaining that process to the public, to trying to answer questions that you know are out there, or at least explain why you don't have the answers to those questions can be helpful as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think with the, like, you know, looking back at this story over the summer, we should have said, you know, why we didn't have a lot of information about what had happened on the University of Texas side of this story with A&M because we, I got so many emails being like, what happened with UTMB? Why didn't you report on them? Um, but it was a matter of they were not as cooperative as UT was, I mean, as A&M was, and we were still waiting for documents from, or the AG's opinion. So I definitely think that's a great piece of advice. So yeah, transparency on our own part. Maybe maybe that's a good place to end. Um, so we're, we're at time here. So um, please join me in, in thanking these great <laughs> journalists for their work. Thank you guys.